so great to see all of you this morning. We are so glad that you're here with us. If you're online, we are so glad that you tuned in with us this morning. Um, as we continue in this time of worship together, we're kind of going to move into a new atmosphere. Um, I just invite you just to really lean into this time, just to quiet your soul and just to listen to what God has to say to you. I know that in my life, I can find it to be so hard just to find brief moment of quiet and stillness just to listen to what God has to say to me. And so we're going to do that for you this morning. We're just going to leave this to be a time that you can listen to what God has to say to you. Um, so however you need to do that, if you need to take a seat and just not sing with us, um, if you need to close your eyes, or even if you still just need to sing, um, however you want to worship with us this morning, uh, we just invite you just to lean in and really listen to God.
And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Have a seat. Man, it is so good to worship together. Whether you're joining us online or you happen to be in person, uh, just welcome. Welcome. If you're new, Man, we are so glad that you are here. Uh, if you're watching online, it's frontlinegr.com forward slash new. We got a gift for you. Uh, if you happen to be actually in the service here, right outside these big barn doors and to your left, you're going to find our next steps area. And we got a gift for you there also. So again, thank you so much for being part of our congregation here. Uh, 20... 20 was a tough year. Everybody agree with that? 2020 was a tough year. 2021, we marked a year that said, hey, we're going to be sent. Uh, we're going to be sent. We're going to be living outside of ourselves. We're going to go and live into the community. Last year, it felt like we were just kind of all combodled inside and we were uh, thinking about ourselves, but we're saying like, hey, what does it look like to think about others in this next year? So in January, we partnered with our, one of our local partners, Alpha Grand Rapids, and we started helping uh, some moms and dads as they were going through some unplanned pregnancies. Uh, in February, we partnered with our care point in Ukro, Ethiopia, and we did some caring with them, wrote some letters to them, and did a, did a virtual tour with them uh, in March. We partnered with our storehouse right over here uh, as they partner with nonprofits and providing goods and services to, uh, to other organizations. And then just yesterday, just yesterday, we were with Grand Rapids Center for Community Transformation. I've got some pictures here. How many people were there yesterday? Do we have some people in here? Where's my painting buddies, okay, that were painting with me on the wall over there? We had a great time. It was just an awesome opportunity for us, again, to live outside of ourselves. Uh, and that's what Frontline is about. Uh, it's not all about just gathering in here. It's about living outside and being the church to the community. And so we've got two other opportunities I want to let you know about. Uh, one is coming up next month in May, May 21st. We are partnering with West Michigan Friendship Center, and we're actually going to put on a picnic for refugees. Uh, so maybe you're not good at uh, some things, but maybe you're good at eating, uh, or maybe you're good at cooking, and we could use you there. So uh, we'd love for you to sign up for that. Uh, but if you can't wait until uh, May 21st, we got something happening actually this week on Thursday. We have an event called Faith at Work, and our own Pastor Brian is going to be talking today And how do we live out our faith in our marketplace, and how do we live out our faith uh, with those we come in contact every day. So if you, can't, if you could make that, that would be awesome, 7 o'clock right here uh, in the worship center, I believe. If it's not here, somebody will direct you to the right spot. But again, thank you for being part of uh, Frontline here. Uh, we can do all of these things. Uh, because you give faithfully to the church and you give sacrificially to the church. So thank you so much for how you do that. Uh, you'll see on the back screen behind me, there's options to give. Uh, if you happen to be in service, there's giving boxes in the back. If you're online, just go ahead and hit frontlinegr.com forward slash give. And we'd love, again, for you to partner with us as we continue to reach out into our community. So I'd love to pray for our offering right now. And then uh, David's going to come up and preach this morning as we continue on our series about four people. So join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you that we have the privilege and the opportunity to worship you. And uh, Lord, um, some heavy things happened this past week in our country, both in Indianapolis and in the state of Minnesota, Lord. And uh, we want to acknowledge that, that not everybody's happy this morning. There's, there's some strife. There's some people that are, are very, very much in need of your presence in their lives right now, Lord. Uh, as they deal with death. And we ask, Lord, that you would be their God during this time. We ask that you would draw close to them, that you would reach out to them, and that they would know you. Uh, Lord, you are in control. Even when it doesn't seem like it, you are in control. We thank you for the privilege of being able to give to you right now. We thank you for how you have blessed this church, how you continue to bless this church. We ask that we would be continually be faithful for what you have given us and to be given it away that's what you were called us to do. We pray this in your name and all God's people said, amen. Hey, good morning. How we doing, Frontline? 
Good, it's good to see you and be with you. It's good to have you if you're watching and joining us online. Uh, welcome to part two. This is week two of a series that we're in called Four People. And uh, just talking about how God is for people. And so if God is for something, then so should we. So I wanna ask you this opening question. The question goes like this. Do you ever get frustrated at people for acting the way that they are supposed to act? Do you ever get frustrated at a teenager for acting like a teenager? I have a toddler, so I'm not there yet. I heard one loud dad in the room that acknowledged that. We'll say thank you, and we're with you, sir. Um, I have a toddler at home last week, Sunday. So Shannon, my wife, is a, a nurse at the hospital, and so my two-and-a-half-year-old uh, is at the home, and he wants to be a big boy. Parents, you guys know what this is like. So he wants to be a big boy, so he grabs this giant cup of water, my cup of water, by the way. He grabs my cup of water, and I'm going, be careful, be careful. And he's picking it up, and he's about to take like one sip, and he goes, nah, never mind. And he goes to set it down so fast, I'm sitting right next to like the side of the counter. He sets it down on the side of the plate and dumps the entire thing on my lap. And I just look at him, and I go, are you kidding me right now? Like, I, I just look like I soiled myself. I'm just soaked. I'm dripping the cabinets. Mom isn't here to help me clean this. It's like, ugh. Okay, do you ever get frustrated when, when people act the way that they're supposed to act? How about this? You ever get frustrated when a police officer writes you a ticket? I've been there, and I got frustrated at him because he did his job. Okay, those of you in school, those of you that were in school, those of you especially who hated school, did you ever get frustrated at a teacher for assigning you homework? It's their job. What about this last one? You ever get frustrated with a politician that lies? <laughs> it's their job. It's what we pay them to do. Just kidding. Too much? Too much? Just trying to feel it out in the room online. Maybe you're still with me. Maybe not. You can click the button. Um, here's my question for you. Do uh, you ever get frustrated at lost people for acting lost? If you're a church person, if you're a Jesus follower, if you've grown up in the church, you ever get frustrated at people who don't have a relationship with Jesus when they act like they don't have a relationship with Jesus? I do. Isn't it funny how oftentimes in the church, I'm going to talk to church people a lot today, okay? So if you're not a church person, if you're not a Jesus follower, if you're sitting back and you're going, hmm, what's he going to say to me? You're going to love what I'm going to say because I'm saying it to everybody else in the room. You're gonna, so for the first time in your life, you might say amen to something a pastor says, because I'm going to talk to the church people today. Don't, isn't it true that we get frustrated with non-Christians, with non-Jesus people, with non-followers of Jesus for acting like it? We get frustrated at people when they lie, when they cheat, when they steal or swear or flip you off or cut corners, bash other people, they use social media like it's their own box to stand on and proclaim. You ever get frustrated when people who don't have a relationship with Jesus act like it? You know, it's funny in the church, there's a lot of unchurched people, a lot of people who don't have a relationship with Jesus that don't like us. Because I think we have this unsaid expectation that even if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're supposed to act like it. And we would much rather watch you and talk about you than love you. And unfortunately, that's what Jesus has called us to do. Not watch, not talk about, love. That's where we're going today. That's what we're going to talk about. We are called to reach and love lost people, but so many of us are shocked or offended or scared of lost people who act lost. If you're going to write something down today, this one's going to blow your mind. Lost people act lost. Lost people act lost. So if our job as the church is to reach lost people, if that's what Jesus modeled for us, we need to change something to fix that. Because there are 45% of the people that live in our city that identify as irreligious. They have no affiliation. That is every single one of us in this room, every single one of us, probably if you're watching in Grand Rapids online, that knows somebody in our city that identifies as irreligious. There are none. I have no affiliation. I have no relationship with Jesus. I have no relationship with anything. It's just me. So if we're called to reach that group of people and that number isn't shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, not yearly, daily, we're doing something wrong. 
And that's what we're going to talk about today, how to do that. And here's the thing. I'm just going to tell you where we're going. We are called to reach lost people. And if we're not pursuing lost people, this is, hey, I have a relationship with Jesus. I'm talking to you. If you are not pursuing lost people, then you are not fully pursuing Jesus. And that's where we're going today. I want to give a couple things. We're going to walk through a fun story together. I want to talk about how do we do that? and do it effectively. So we're going to jump into one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. It's out of Luke 15. You've probably heard it before, whether you grew up in church or not. It's the prodigal son. We're going to read this together. We're going to unpack it. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Uh, Here's how this worked. Middle Eastern culture. I'm going to do it fast because a lot of you probably heard this already. Older son would inherit two-thirds of the father's estate when the father passes away. So the older son gets two-thirds. The younger son, who we're talking about, would get a third. So instead of waiting for dad to die, instead of waiting for that to happen, instead of trusting his brother to split that up accordingly, he says, Dad, I just want it, and I want it now. So what's his father do? He does this. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He took the inheritance. The father gave it to him. He took all that he had, which came from who? The father took all that he had, he set off for a distant country, and there, oh, this word just hurts, all the Dutch people in the room just, oh, he squandered it. He wasted it. Another, another translation of this word, he scattered it. It just went every which direction, he didn't even know. He squandered it on what? His wealth in wild living. We're gonna learn a little bit more about what that was. He was partying, he was drinking, probably doing drugs, he was sleeping around, there were prostitutes involved. He squandered it. One third of his inheritance. This is a giant sum of money. Gone. So he squandered it. After he had spent how much? Everything. He was bankrupt. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. Something just happened outside of his control, outside of his sphere of influence. The entire country went through the same thing. It just happened to him at his worst moment. He had nothing. So it says this, he began to be in need. Some of you in this room, some of you watching online know what it's like to go from the top to the bottom. Some of you know what it's like to go from having everything to having nothing. We could be talking finances, we can be talking relationships, we could be talking positions or jobs or houses. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. Many of us in this room understand what it's like to go from here down to here. And it says probably for the first time in his entire life, he began to have need. So what happens? So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country. Remember, he's distant. He's far off. He's in a country not his own. So he hires himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. You know you've been demoted when you go from partying it up to feeding pigs, but it gets worse. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything. How hungry do you have to be to look at this and your mouth starts watering? Not a lot of us in the room are going, wow, I can't wait for lunch. I'm making that when I get home. How about this one? I was like, that's too far away. Let's zoom in. It looks like some former remnants of maybe some bananas, maybe some vegetables. And then that like curdling is kind of like a natural process when things just begin to decay. So that's in a bucket, and he's taking this bucket, and he's feeding pigs who don't care. They eat any, they'll eat themselves. He's feeding these pigs, and he doesn't cross his mind, I could eat one of these pigs. We all know, bacon, amen, I'm with you. He looks at this, and he goes, that makes me hungry. How hungry do you have to be for that to look appealing? To, for that to make your mouth water? to think that might settle the rumbling in my stomach. Oh, that sounds good. How hungry was he? The thing that bugs me, nobody gave him anything. 
Jesus, as he's telling this story, he's talking to a group of religious people and a group of irreligious people. So church people and non-church people. What do all the church people feel when Jesus gets to this point in the story? What would you feel if you're like, hey, I, I've done everything right. Hey, I, I've lived a good life. I've made good decisions. I've planned for famines like this. Maybe some of the things that come to your mind uh, would be this. I'll articulate them for you since maybe not all of you would want to be this honest. That's what happens when you're a dummy. What goes around comes around. When you treat your dad like that, you end up feeding pigs. Some of you parents, you're like, amen. I'm just going to say it quietly, just loud enough for my child to hear me. What about this one? That'll teach him. A little bit vindictive. A little bit like, mm -hmm. hope you learn your lesson. Jesus knows the heart of the people that are listening to him. And the religious people who feel this way, this is a fake story. Remember, Jesus just made this up. It's a metaphor. It's a story. But it initiates or elicits a reaction deep within the hearts and souls of people that identifies how you really see other people. How big is your grace tank? Because there are a lot of people in that room or in that area, just like there's a lot of people in this room or in our area or watching online that would feel something similar as we see somebody else play that part of their life out. They go, this is what happens when you live the way you live. This is what you get. This is where you end up. This is what happens. It's how your world works, and it's how our world works. I want to ask you, do you know anybody like that in your life? Ask it. I want to ask it differently. How about this? Who's lost in your life? Remember the, be the beginning? Lost people act lost. Who acts lost in your life? Who acts lost? Chances are, they're lost. They don't have a relationship with Jesus. You know, a, a life apart from Jesus always ends in unfulfillment. It always ends in need. It always ends in loneliness. And it always ends in independence. It's this thing, it's a value of our country. We want to be independent. God says, my kingdom is the opposite. It's dependence upon me. Independence, you die. You end up like this kid in the middle of a field, feeding pigs, starving. God's saying, I have more for you than that. As you think, now I'm talking to you, in the room, listening right now, watching online, maybe listening later on a podcast, whatever. Who's lost in your life? Who is in your context that is running from something? Who's making horrible decisions? Who's crippled by pain or fear, overwhelmed with need in the middle of a crisis? Some of you, it's you. Probably all of you, it's somebody else. Our lives are too interconnected to be insulated from lost people. Sometimes we don't want to talk to lost people. Sometimes we don't want to get too close because it's, it hurts or it costs us or it's uncomfortable or they're weird. Jesus calls us to reach lost people, but to reach lost people first means we need to identify them. We need to be able to see someone else and look at their life and say, your life is not what you do. Your, your life is about your relationship with Jesus. You either have one or you don't. We need, to be, we need to put our crosshairs on people who don't have a relationship with Jesus because as the church, that's who we're sent to. Jesus said, I did not come for the healthy. I came for the sick. And then later he said, I, I came to seek and to save the lost. And then in Matthew 28, right before he ascends into heaven, he looks at his followers he looks at his people and he said, go do what I did. Go make disciples. That's people who don't have a relationship with me. Turn them into people who have a relationship with me. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you and I'll be with you. This is so central to the purpose and the identity of Jesus. 
So who in your life is lost? Before we go too far, I, I do want to acknowledge this. Isn't it true it's very difficult to watch people you love struggle? I, I don't want to ignore the fact that, you know, here's this story about a kid that runs from home and squanders his wealth, and every parent inside has this piece of them that you go, oh, I feel that differently. Maybe you've lived that story Maybe you're afraid of living that story. Maybe you're close to that story. Maybe you're walking with somebody else who is living that story. That Parents understand what it's like to have a child that rejects them. And many of us understand what it's like to have a child that rejects God. And I can only imagine what the father in this story must feel to have his beloved son run and run far, far away. I think so often when we see people struggling, we have no idea what to say or no idea what to do. And so our default, especially in West Michigan, I haven't lived in West Michigan my entire life, but I've learned this. The default here is to say or do nothing. You kind of take a step back to disengage, and to watch. People are desperate right now. As a pastor, over the last few months, I mean, you guys need to know, our counseling department here is slammed. They are packed. There are so many people who are hurting and broken and lonely and depressed and addicted and anxious, and they are struggling. And you see them. It's hard to watch people you love struggle. But here's the thing that drives me nuts. I want to put this last verse up. The thing that drives me nuts about this whole story is this one. But no one gave him anything. Have you ever caught that before, if you've heard this story? Here he is. He's in the middle of the field. Boss didn't help. Friends didn't help. Funny, everybody wants to be your friend when you're loaded till the money disappears and then it's like, oh, you're on your own, man. The crisis hit, every man for himself. His friends didn't help him. His neighbors didn't help him. His coworkers didn't help him. He has an older brother. His older brother didn't come looking for him. Here's the other thing that bugs me. Not one mention of a church person. Not one mention of somebody who has a relationship with Jesus that says, man, kid looks like he's struggling. I'll probably give him something. No one gave him anything. Let's keep reading. Verse 17, it says this. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, catch the change of heart. Catch the change of heart. Isn't it true that crises often precede a change of heart? That often when life gets worse, the worst it's ever been, or we hit the bottom, or we run out, or we're all alone, whatever it is, isn't it funny how that moment often precedes a movement of change? catch what he does. Here's what he's thinking. He's, he's about to negotiate, right? He's playing out the negotiation in his head. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Is he looking for reconciliation? Is he looking for the relationship to be made right? Or is he looking for a job? Which one would you be more interested in? I want to ask you this question. He, he's walking out this negotiation in his mind. Have you ever, like, tried to negotiate something before? I love negotiating. I negotiate just for the heck of it. I just think it's fun. I, I've been at a lands I found a new landscaping company uh, two days ago. I've been there four times already. I've negotiated every single time. I'm like, I'm going to be your favorite customer. And in my head, I'm like, that doesn't really make sense. I ask him for money off, and they're like, no, keep coming back. So I think I'm negotiating. Maybe I'm not negotiating well. Have you ever tried to negotiate with God, though? Have you ever tried to negotiate with God? God, if you do this, then I will do that. 
God, if you will provide me this, then I will give you that. God, if you will bring me a wife, then I will blank. Have you ever tried negotiating with God? I have. Never works. Absolutely never works. Here's, here's been my experience of God when it comes to negotiation. There is no negotiation. It's never, okay, if you do this, I'll do that. He's never said to me, I've never heard him say, Ooh, man, that is a good offer. I've never heard him say, wow, I think you caught me. Got me a bit over a barrel here. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I, I've never experienced any of this. Do you know what I experienced from God? I wrote this down just so that, that I articulate it just right. God does not negotiate with us when we wrong him or when we want something from him. God does not negotiate with us. God already negotiated for us. Some of you need to write that down. God does not negotiate with us. God negotiated for us through Jesus on the cross. You can almost laugh if you just think about it from the perspective of someone else. As they come to God, God said, I, I paid the price for you. I paid the price for your sins. I went to the cross. I did that for you so that you, might, you and I might have a relationship that he, it might be made right. And we come and we ask for something else or something different. And God says, what else matters? The negotiation's already taken place. You won. I, I paid for it. I paid for everything. This is how God negotiates. He goes first and he goes all in for your benefit. And he never loses. That is so frustrating until you realize you're always on the winning side with him. Look at what happens here. The son goes back, he actually talks to his dad. Remember, this is a story Jesus is telling to display the heart of God for his listeners. It says this, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. That word compassion is gut level. It's like, oh, my bowels, it moves me. Imagine the heart of a father who has longed for his son day and night, who has wept for him, who has prayed for him, who has begged God to bring him home. He sees his son from a long way off. And his father was moved with such compassion, he ran to his son, which an old man in that era never would do. It's dishonorable. He doesn't care. He ran to his son, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Notice the start of the negotiation. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And he acknowledges right in that moment something that's true. Yes, you did. That's called sin. And what he just did is he acknowledged it, he repented of it. And then he says, This. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Incorrect. What can remove his status as son? All the parents in the room again. What can remove the status of your children as your children? I'll verbalize it. Nothing. Nothing. If you can't lose your identity, then you can't gain it either. His father looks at his son and he says, you may have squandered everything you had, but you will always be my son. It's like his father doesn't even pay attention to the rest of the speech. Look what he says. The father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Dad does not listen or engage in the negotiation at all. Dad says, you came back home? Party time. And we all know he knows how to party. Let's grab the fattened calf. 
Let's get our friends and family. Let's bring it all in. Let's throw this giant celebration. What he came back looking for was a job, and what he received was grace. He was lost, and now he's found. This is how God sees lost people. He knows lost people are going to act lost. But someday, sometime, a crisis is going to hit. Money is going to run out. A relationship is going to break. Something else is going to implode. They're going to be unemployed. They're going to end up homeless. At some point, they will hit this point in their life that all of us know all too familiar. They can no longer change it for themselves. And the crisis often precedes a heart change. God knows that about lost people. God loves lost people. And when they come back, God doesn't negotiate for them. The negotiation is already done. I've already died for you. Welcome home. This is how God sees lost people, which leads me to this question. Do you see lost people the same way that God sees them? Do you see lost people the same way that God sees them? I wrote this down. I just thought this was funny. Lost people are evil until you get to know them. Then they're just broken. You ever feel that? You're just wicked. Oh, you had a horrible life. You had a horrible childhood. You were struggling. You have no hope. You have no future. You're just broken. It's funny how different Life can be as a believer in Jesus when we see lost people the same way Jesus sees lost people. I want to tell you about three people in my life that I'm going after uh, that are lost. I hope this will encourage you because I'm going to share them with you by the amount of time I've been pursuing. First one, these are fake names, some of them. (laughs) Uh, For three years, I've been pursuing a friend of mine named John. John's made horrible decisions in his life. He's been arrested a number of times. He actually ended up here uh, doing community service for us. So I built a relationship with him. I I offered, I said, hey, you want to go to lunch together? Uh, It counts for your hours. And he's like, heck yeah, free lunch covers hours. That's what I'm talking about. I totally had an agenda, 100%. I'll tell you right now, I'd tell him. I've told him I had an agenda. I've always had an agenda with him. He's lost, man. He's broken. He's hurting. He's struggling. He's in jail right now. He's in jail right now. You know, what's so funny is when crisis hits, the heart change begins to occur. I got to talk to him this week from jail. I got to talk to him this week. I gave him a book. I said, let's read this book together. It's called Crazy Love by Francis Chan. It'll change how you see God forever. And I said, what else are you going to do? Ha! You're stuck, man. You're stuck. Let's read a book. I'll talk to you every single week. We'll talk about what you read. We'll unpack it. I'll talk about question. For the first time in three years, he's finally open to having a dialogue about Jesus. Here's another one. Uh, this is a guy named Tom. That's his real name. Uh, he's a Buddhist monk here in Grand Rapids. I'm like, let's swing for the fence. You know, let's not go for somebody like middle of the road, sitting on the fence, not sure about Jesus. It's like, nope, I'm running with Buddha and I'm so far down. I've been doing that for 40 years. So I'm going, hey, my name's David. I showed up at the temple one day. It's a true story. Showed up, knocked on the door. It was early in the morning. I said, hey, my name's David. Tiny little guy. I said, hey, my name's David. I'm not here to hurt you. I just want to ask questions. Can I, can I see your temple? He, sure. So he walks me through. He shows me the temple. There's a giant red cross in their carpet. It's so funny. I went, if only you knew. I've been pursuing him for two years. Nothing. No bow. No story. No happy ending. I gave him a Bible once. He was so excited about it. And then COVID hit. And he won't meet. He won't talk. He's very fearful. I'm still pursuing. Here's the third one. Uh, I have a guy... Uh, he's a former Marine. He's in the Marines for 10 years. I've known him for three weeks. I know he's not a believer. 
I'm doing everything I can to spend time with him, to ask him questions, to get to know his life, to walk with him in hopes that someday when a crisis hits, someday when a heart change occurs, someday when he becomes open to something that, that he knows, I, I at least have one friend who's a believer. The outcome is God's responsibility. The obedience is ours. Who in your life is lost that you need to set your target on and say, I'm gonna pursue you even if it's for the rest of my life. To some of you, it might be. This last thing, two last things. One is this, if we're not pursuing lost people, we're not fully pursuing Jesus. I want you to fully pursue Jesus. As one of your pastors who just loves you like crazy, on a level many of you just never will understand, I want this for you because you discover an intimacy with God when you do what God asks you to do. And the only way you can experience that is if you do it. So pursue Jesus with everything you have, but pursue lost people with the same intensity. This last one, I walked into a, into a chiropractor's office this last week. I started seeing a chiropractor like two years ago um, COVID hit, I was gone for a while, whatever. I went back for the first time. There's a guy in the front office uh, that kind of just became a friend of mine. He was a buddy, I would call him. Um, for the Nobody calls each other anymore, right? We know that. So I would call the office to do something that I could have done over email just because I like this guy, I like talking to him. And uh, I haven't seen him in a long time, but he and I were building a relationship. I knew he, he probably didn't have a relationship with Jesus. So uh, I went in this last week and I said, hey, you know, is, is so-and-so here? I'd be awesome to see him. They go, no, he's, he doesn't work here anymore. He's like my age. I go, what? What happened? Go, he, he passed away from suicide. This was in August. That hit me on such a deep level. Because we don't have forever. They don't have forever. Jesus looked at us and he saw us at our worst. And he says, I love you and you're worth it. And there are people like that all over our city, all over our country, all over our world, all over our families, our neighborhoods, you name it. There are people like that, that God our Father loves deeply. And he has sent us to be him to them. Two things you can do. First one is this, and get real about this. Write down the names of three lost people in your life. Before you leave today, before you get in the car, put them on your phone, text them to yourself, email them, share them with your spouse, share them with your friends, share them with your roommate. Write down the names of three lost people in your life. And then number two is do this. Take advantage of every opportunity to walk with them. You don't have to pedal. You don't have to push, you don't have to force, you do have to love. And loving costs something. Jesus did it for us. He's in, encouraged, he's commanded, he's asked us to do it for others. Let's pray together. Father, there are lost people all over the place right now. COVID has wreaked havoc on our world it's wreaked havoc on our community. It's affected every one of us on a different level, in different ways, in different contexts, and it has affected lost people the most who don't have hope, who don't have a relationship with you, who don't know that you are already king, who don't know that you are superior, who don't know that you are above every virus, every bacteria, every cancer, every phenomenon, every leader, every government. They don't know, and so they're scared and they're worried and they're fearful and they're anxious and they're depressed and they're struggling. Father, send us, raise up disciples from this church. Raise up disciples who are listening online. Raise up disciples from those who are watching online. Raise up your disciples to be your hands and feet to a lost and broken world because if we don't do it, no one will. Father, give us the intensity. Give us the passion. Give us the boldness 
to do what you've called us to do. And Father, what we pray for right now, you are the one responsible for the fruit. Would you bring fruit to our community? Would you bring fruit to our church? Would you bring fruit to your church all over the world? We love you. We thank you for Jesus. We pray this in his name. And everybody said together, amen. Please stand and continue to worship with us today.
Amen? Amen. Some of you in this room maybe are lost. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. It's not hard. But I want to give you an invitation. And we're, we have a prayer team that is going to be at the exits. Though some of them will be up front here at the Jesus wall. If you say, today is the day that I want a relationship with Jesus, don't wait. Do it. Make it happen. For others of you in here who do have a relationship with Jesus, one of the best next steps for you is to be here Thursday night. Brian, our lead pastor, is gonna unpack what it means to follow Jesus in the workplace. That's at home, that's at work, that's at school, that's in your neighborhood. And he's gonna talk to you and give you practical things on how to build a relationship with people who are lost, that can lead towards life. So don't miss it. Uh, I wanna close with this, Uh, it's just a benediction, uh, which basically means blessing as you go. So if you wanna stick out your hands just as a posture of reception uh, and receive this blessing on your way out. Brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, both in person and online, as you go back into your context this week, remember that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Let's pursue lost people in our city in our workplaces, in our families, in our neighborhoods, together, just like Jesus pursued all of us. The response is his responsibility, but the obedience is ours. Everybody said together, amen. Let's go pursue some lost people. We love you guys, and we'll see you next week for part three.